The flight was sheer luxury compared to the conditions the military airmen experienced back in 1942. Then came an announcement that brought a chill and a thrill. Ladies and gentlemen, we're now descending to land at Guadalcanal. We'll be on the ground at Henderson Field in just a few moments. Thank you. Guadalcanal, Henderson Field. That's what it's all about. And I'd be there in a minute. This great modern jet airport is the successor to and carries the same name as that little muddy battle-scarred field that was the objective of the entire campaign for Guadalcanal. This was the spot where history began. My friend marine biologist, Dr. Wallace Stark, was waiting for me, and it was good to see Walter again. We were both anxious to get to his research vessel, El Torito, and lay out our plans for my rendezvous with history. As we headed for the car, Walter pointed out the anti-aircraft gun that stood in front of the airport. It was one of those which had served so effectively in the early days of the campaign, when the holding of this field was in such precarious balance. I couldn't help but wonder back on those moments, reflect upon the action in which this weapon had served, on the men who made it work, and on the other group of men it had worked on. But we would go into that later. as they came screaming out of the blackness. And imagine we can hear the sounds that filled that night. Machine guns and rifle fire, the whistle of mortars and artillery shells, the blasts of grenades, and the screams of the wounded and the dying. hidden in the tall grass is some of the barbed wire strung by the Marines so effectively. There was little of it available then, but Colonel Edson's men put it in the right places and it did the job. And after three decades of weathering, it's still as sharp as it was that night when the Japanese were pinned to it. But the battle was only half over. Colonel Edson pulled his small forces back and repositioned them on a tighter dug-in line. Kawaguchi repositioned his forces too. At 6.30 in the evening of September 13th, the battle began again. The Japanese struck hard at the Marines' west flank. They slammed into the middle sector. And finally, they smashed into the parachute companies on the east side. It was a repetition of the first night's affair. Only the Japanese charges were even more violent and fanatic. They were pressed hard by marine artillery fire, which was brought into play. More than 3,000 rounds were poured into their lines, but the pressure on the raiders was tremendous. As the waves of screaming Japanese continued to rush at them, the Marines were pushed back further into an ever-shrinking perimeter. The situation was desperate, and the future of Henderson was precarious indeed. Now this is the way the ridge looks today, from the Japanese position.
The Marines were dug in on that hill, and the enemy was pouring out of the jungle and storming up the hill into a hail of fire. As dawn broke, it ended right here. The paratroopers were forced to within 10 yards of the top of the ridge, but they stopped the enemy's final thrust at this wire. This shrine was erected in 1971. Not far away is another Japanese shrine. Kawaguchi's forces had suffered terrible losses of about 4,000 men. It is estimated that 2,000 of them died on the ridge or in the jungle nearby. Marine losses were 40 killed or missing and 103 wounded. It was a great victory for the Marines and is commemorated by this marker erected at the site of Colonel Edson's command post. In their tradition, they had won against great odds and had saved Henderson Field. A few feet from the Marine Memorial is this corner post, marking the boundaries of a cattle ranch which now operates on the sides of Bloody Ridge. The men who fought so hard and so long on the banks of the Matanaka River would never believe what's happened to the area since they've left. It has now become a prosperous retailing center. Stores run by Chinese merchants dominate the scene. And it's the hub of the sizable Chinese community that now prospers on Guadalcanal. After the war, the British Solomon Island government established Honiara as the new capital instead of rebuilding at Tulagi. Thus, it's an all-new city. They have provided all the conveniences of modern-day living, and that even includes two traffic signals on the main street, and even the occasional traffic jam. There are stores galore selling every conceivable type of merchandise. There's a motion picture theater, many government offices, Honiara is the trading and communications center for all of the Solomon Islands. There are many buses which deliver the populace of outlying villages to the city center. There aren't many car owners in Guadalcanal, and the bus service is important. One of the loveliest things about Honiara are the flame or Christmas trees that line the city streets. There are several hotels. The newest and largest is the Mendana, where I stayed. And there are some private clubs, the Yacht Club on the Beach, and the fashionable Guadalcanal Club. There are a lot of fine soccer players in Honiara, and this field is a busy one. There are churches too, many of them, and they serve a very devout group of people. 